Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Enzyme Replacement Therapy Injection Techniques. I'm so excited to bring this webinar to the SoftBones community. I, I think that it's something we see that's uh, quite an active topic of discussion on our, uh, our, on our uh, social media boards and on HPP and me, and it's an area where we, we do get a lot of questions. And so uh, we've assembled quite a, an impressive panel of experts tonight to talk about their uh, key learnings and tips and tricks and proper techniques. And I wanna give a special thanks to Alexion, who's our, our sponsor for tonight and also a presenter. So um, we're going to uh, jump right in in just a second, but before we get started, we wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, uh, please keep your please make sure your microphone is muted for the presentation. That will help to make sure there's no background sound or any distractions during the presentation. Attendees after the meeting uh, will be automatically directed to breakout rooms per region immediately following the Q&A portion of the presentation. Those breakout rooms will be open for 30 minutes and then they will shut down. If you have any trouble, please be sure to alert us in the chat window. And finally, also in the chat window, if you have any questions uh, during the course of the presentation, just go ahead and pop them right in the chat and we will be sure to address them as we go. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And I'm going to pull up the presentation. Can you see my slides? Okay, there we go. So our first speaker, I'm pleased to welcome Karen Mack. She's from Shriners Hospital in St. Louis and she's a nurse who's been caring for children with rare bone diseases at Shriners since 1983. She's been working with patients with hypophosphatasia for the past 13 years and has been actively involved in all aspects of the clinical trials of Strensic at the um, St. Louis Shriners Hospital for Children. She has a passion for patients and family education and is exciting to be helping us here with SoftBones to provide this training. So Karen, I'm gonna go ahead and, and toss it over to you for your presentation. Thanks Deb, I appreciate um, you inviting me to speak tonight. So, um, as Deb mentioned, I am the nurse here at Shriners, and I worked with the patients um, in the Strensic study. So, we're going to review the steps in giving the Strensic medication, um, the supplies you need, review the technique, give some tips, uh, the importance of rotating the injection sites, some precautions to be aware of, and then after, uh, and skin reactions that will occur and some that you don't want to have happen. And then um, a demonstration on doing the strength-seek injection. And then after that, we'll uh, talk about what the uh, usefulness of the in injectees device. Next slide, please. So Strength Seek, it's the liquid medication that comes in different concentrations. Um, you see a picture of the uh, vials there, and it comes in about four different uh, strengths, depending on the dose that the doctor will order. Next. So subcutaneous injection is when the medication, it's a liquid form, is injected into the fatty tissues just under the skin. The medication absorbs solely through the skin, and the amount of liquid should not be more than one millimeter in area. So my example is if you need a dose of 1.5 milliliters, you need to divide that into 0.75 mLs and then do it in two separate injections. My example here is to do one in the right arm and one in the left arm. Next. Dosing. The recommended dosing is one milligram of Strenzeek per kilogram of body weight, administered six days a week. Um, the FDA also mentions three days a week, but we found six days a week is better for the absorption of the drug, especially when you're first starting on it. And it um, keeps down the skin reactions that you'll see pictures of later that you do not want to have happen. Next. So the supplies you need is syringe, a one millimeter, we prefer the tuberculin syringe 
with a 21 gauge needle that can be detached. Um, alcohol prep, the zinc vial, uh, a smaller gauge needle so that when you're inserting it to your skin, uh, it's much more comfortable. And then the two by two gauze sponge. And the big thing, um, wash your hands before you get started. All right, next. So before you take any of the medicine out, be sure to look at the vial. Be sure it's clear. It should not have any color to it. It should not be cloudy. It should not have any particles in it. If it does, you need to let the pharmacy know. And do not mix this with any other solution. We also found that if you let the drug warm up to room temperature about 20 to 30 minutes, um, it's more comfortable uh, for the injection going into the skin. Next. Relax, take a breath. This will come routine. I want you to do it a couple of times. So you'll, the vial, remove the cap. Do not remove the stopper. Wipe the vial, the vial with the alcohol prep. Next. So some tips and techniques. So what you want to do is like in the picture, you want to invert. Uh, you want to pull back on um, the syringe, allowing some air, approximately half the amount of the dose that's going to be administered. So example, if you're going to give a 0.6 ml uh, milliliters, you want to point, pull back about 0.3. Um, this will get some air and able to get the liquid out a little easier. And you want to uh, push the needle through the stopper it put the air in, but slowly, because if you do it too fast, you're going to get air bubbles. Next. So you're going to have the needle in, you put in the air. So now you're going to draw back to get the medicine out. You want to have the vial upside down. You want the needle to be stay in the liquid and pull back uh, slowly on the amount that you want. If you end up with lots of bubbles, just slowly put the medicine back in and start all over again. <clears throat> Next. So you might find a little air bubbles in there. Those are easy to take out. Uh, just flick or tap the side of the syringe and those bubbles should float to the top. There's a couple up in where the needle area is, that's fine. So now here you want to remove the larger needle and apply the smaller needle. And they usually just twist on and off. And then check again, be sure there's no bubbles and then you can advance the last little bubbles up into the new needle that you put on. Next. So rotating injection sites is very important. I'll show you some slides in a little bit uh, with some problems that can, can occur if you do it in the same area. So you've got lots of spots. You've got the arms, you've got the uh, area around your belly button, uh, your abdomen, your legs, your thigh areas, uh, your outer buttocks area. So next. So you want to clean the area on the skin after you've selected your site on a circular motion about the size of an orange area. You want the skin to dry a bit, but do not blow or wave your hand over it. You don't want to do that. Now you want to pinch some skin. It's about squeeze up about, about a half inch of the skin. And there is where you're going to be able to uh, get it as a sub Q injection not an IM injection. You don't want it into the muscle. Next. So take a breath. This is easy. They're only going to feel a little prick. So before you in, insert the needle, you want to look at the needle. And at the end, you'll see there's a spot where it's kind of open. That means beveled up. And that's the way you want to hold the syringe with that needle bevel up. Next. So you want to insert the needle either at a 90 or a 45 degree angle, depending on how much skin you can hold on. So uh, once you've put the needle in the skin, you can release the hand that was holding the skin. Next slide. 
because one of the big precautions is you want to be sure that you're not hitting uh, a nerve or a blood vessel. So with the hand that you just released, you want to steady the syringe, pull back on the plunger of the syringe to be sure that you do not have a blood return. Fully not, you only need to do it about uh, the point one on the syringe. If none appears, then you can go ahead and slowly inject the medication. If blood appears, withdraw the needle and prepare a new syringe. Next. So you've got the needle in the, in the skin, you're advancing the drug, pulling the needle, pushing um, the plunger down. Uh, after all the medicine is in, leave the needle in for just one or two seconds so the skin has a chance to absorb all of it. Gently pull the needle out in the same direction you inserted it. Then apply the two by two gauze to the area and then gently rub massage the area for about 10 seconds. Next. So now you want to not to recap the needle. You just wanna put it in, in your disposable um, hazard box or if you don't have one of those and um, empty milk jug will work too. So you wanna throw away um, your supplies. Next. So some of the associated reactions. So with these drug, you're gonna have some redness and some bruising at the injection site. That's normal. Some problems with the lipo hypertrophy or the excessive skin folds, that occurs if you're injecting it too much in the same area. Reactions that you do not wanna see is a rash, shaking chills, numbness or tingling of the hands or feet, buzzing or tingling of the lips. Those are serious problems. You need to call the doctor or get to the emergency room. Next. Now in the 24 hours after the injection, uh, you could end up with the redness that is the child with the red shirt there. Um, that's fortunately normal. It's a bit raised, it's gonna be warm. Uh, cold compresses on there um, should help with the pain, taking um, some Tylenol for the discomfort would be great. On the other slide though, that is way too much of a reaction. You need to call the physician. And that reaction could happen on the first shot or after you've taken it for a couple of times, but that's gonna to be too much of a reaction. Next slide. So now the skin folds, as I like to call them, um, is when someone has done it too much in your forearm, that's what you're gonna look. Like if you do it too much in the abdomen, that could be what you come up with. And we found that it does not go away. On the littler kids with the abdomen, sometimes it gets a little better as they get older because they're growing, but um, if you're gonna do, it's gonna be there. Next slide. So being on Strinzeek gives you a chance to reach heights that you never thought you could before. It's the best thing ever for hypophosphatasia children and adults. Okay, now I'd like um, to introduce my coworker, Amy Reeves. She's going to help me with a demonstration as I walk her through it and give a sub Q injection. So Amy's gathered her supplies. She put down a nice, uh, just a paper top because you want a nice clean area. She's washing her hands. Okay, and then she's going to open up the alcohol wipes, usually two, one for the vial and then one for the skin. Yeah, go ahead and remove the Okay, and you wanna go ahead and open up your uh, two by two um, gauze pad so you have that ready. Now she's gonna, uh, since she's taken the vial of medicine out, uh, it's been out, it's almost about room temperature. She's looking at it to be sure it is clear. There's no particles, looks good. Now off comes the topper. She's gonna wipe the top with the alcohol pad. Okay, and that while that dries, she can be opening up the syringe. 
And at that time, also open up the other needle you're gonna switch off to. Okay. And taking off the needle. Because the dose we're going to do tonight is 0. 0.6. Mm -hmm. So, okay, take the cap off. It's going to pull back to about 0. 0.3. Mm -hmm. All right, and then straight into the center if you can, stopper, and turn it open and slowly put in the air. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and now she can pull back on the point six, going slowly, keeping the tip of the needle into the liquid. It's like she's just got one small air bubble, so that's great. We can get that out in a little bit. And you probably want to pull back a little bit more past the point six, past your dose, if you can, about one more cc, so she's at seven take it out because it looks like she's got too many bubbles and now she's going to hold it and click on it and the bubbles come into the top there, there we go. go okay now she's going to carefully recap the big needle so she can get it off twist it off and apply the smaller one Okay, take the needle off of there, and then she's going to check for bubbles in advance all the way now up to the 0. 0.6, which is the dose. Of course, the medicine is going to come out of the top of the needle. That's okay. fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you um, need to lay it down, you don't want to be to have the needle touch, you could lay it in the top of the gauze. Like such? Yes. That'll keep it, the needle up off the ground. So we're going to decide on a spot where we inject. Oh boy. So <laughs> you've got a lot to grab a hold of here. Okay. Outer area, the All skin. Right. So you have an alcohol wipe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. And a nice, All right. area. Yes. Okay. okay. It's drying just up a little bit. Okay, and she's looking to be sure that the bevel is up. The bevel is up. Okay, and she's pinching. In, hold, hold steady. Hold the syringe. Pull back on the plunger a little bit. No return. Sorry. And just touch the, and we're good. Okay, and she noticed that there's no blood, and she's advancing. The amount in. It's a couple seconds, gets her two by two gauze pad, removes the needle and massages a little bit. Okay, that's it. Now we could talk about the Strenzik. So if you are the only one there to give yourself an injection, one of the devices that they have, there's a couple of different styles. Of, you could get them online, you can get it at Walgreens, you can get it at Walmart. It's called an Inject Ease. Next. So an inject cheese, you'll need to, when you get it in the box, you'll need to assemble it. It's got a plunger cap, a trigger button, a finger rest, an adapter tip, and a needle cap. Next. So it is a one button, ease of use. It provides independence. It's designed for one-handed use, allows access to harder to reach injection sites. It's a one press needle insertion, inserts the needle through the skin automatically and easily. It's designed for multiple size syringes, and it comes with spacers in order for you to customize the injection depth. 
And for proper needle penetration, uh, you need to be sure you have the adapters in the right amount to get the injectees to get the needle into your skin. Next slide. So there's two spacer rings, a one eighth and one fourth of width. Um, you slide the appropriate ring before each adapter tip. We'll show you that. We'll pull the latch bar up towards to cock the device and you push the latch T-bar backward to open the locking mechanism. Insert the syringe containing your pre-measured dose with the needle cap on to prevent needle contamination. So you'd get the drug ready in your syringe, just like we did. And then you push the last T-bar forward to lock the syringe in place. Next. You press the trigger button to expose the needle cap, remove the cap and set it aside. Pull the latch T-bar upward to recock the device. Hold the injectee so your thumb is on the trigger. Place the device next to your skin at the injection site. Now press the trigger button, push in the plunger with your index finger. Now your injection is complete. Next slide. So you remove the device from your skin, apply, pull the latch upward to cock the device, pull it backward to unlock the syringe, then you can safely lift the syringe from the device and discard it um, in your biohazard container. Next, that's it. So I wanna show you what um, the homes in a box, the injectees. It comes with an instruction sheet. Maybe it's going to help with putting it together as we talk about it. So, so she's going to notice that there are three different adapters, depending on the size of your syringe, uh, the holes are different sizes. So for the tuberculin syringe, you're just going to use the um, one point ML. And then she has all the little rings that they talked about to adjust to be sure you get it the right length. Now with continued use, the best thing to do if you get it the right amount of rings and set up is to go ahead and tape those rings in place. Otherwise they'll keep coming off on you. So she's taken the back uh, cover off and now she's going to get ready to put in the syringe. So she cocked up the back and you'll see where you can put in the syringe. Okay. All right, and then cock it back to put it into the place. Then you'll see at the bottom here is where she'll be taking off the needle okay. cover. Okay. I don't know if you can barely see, but the needle's there. Then you need to recock it so that the needle goes back in here mm -hmm. and then lay it just up against your skin. Yeah, it's got air in it, so that's okay. Yeah. So you find your spot if you're doing it by yourself. You can wipe, clean your area off. <laughs> And stabilize it with these two handles here. This is the button you want to push. Goes in. Don't push the And then you just advance the needle in. Okay. You can do the same with the two by two and rub the area to help get the medicine to absorb better. Great. Thank you very much for allowing um, Amy and I to show you about sub injections and the in injectees. That finishes our presentation.
Deb, back to you. Thank you. We actually had two questions I thought we could cover off quickly before we move on. Um, one of them was, if you um, pull back on the needle and you do draw a little bit of blood and you prepare a new syringe, as, um, that's assuming you also prepare a new vial as well. You wouldn't, you obviously couldn't use the same medication or could you reuse the same medication? If, if it's that same day, that same moment, and if there's enough in the vial, you could go ahead. Otherwise, you would need to get another another vial yes. preparing. Yeah. Vial. Okay, and then the um, the second one was more of uh, I think a question of technique, and I've experienced this sometimes myself, where sometimes when you insert the needle into the vial, it seems like it's hard to get enough medication. It seems like there's just barely, uh, you know, that 0. 0.6 it's in there. Do you have any techniques or, or um, advice about making sure ways that you can ensure to draw all of the, the medication out of the vial? Um, yeah, we don't have the small vials. It's basically just wanting to keep that tip of that needle just barely past the stopper, mm -hmm. you know, just barely past in there so that you can get every drop. You don't want to have the needle way up into the vial because then it seems like it just puts in too much air. Yeah. And you can't get every drop out then. Oh, that makes sense. I've done that too, where I've, I put it in too far and then I pull it out just so it's just inside the stopper so you can get those yes. last few yes. drops out of there. Yes. It, it is kind of a little, it takes a little getting used to to get that technique down, but yes. um, with practice, it, it does get easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to move on. Thank you, Karen. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jenny Kaysen, and she's a child life specialist at Monroe Carroll Junior Ho Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. She's going to share her tips for helping prepare yeah. families to ease into the routine of injections, drawing from the experience that she's gained from working with many different disease states. So Jenny, why don't you, uh, we can't wait to hear from you about your tips and tricks. So why don't you take it away? Thank you so much. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Child Life, um, we are a profession that assists families um, and children, generally speaking, in the medical facilities um, or medical care um, to help provide support through lots of different modalities. Um, and one is like providing education um, and just helping children cope with being in a hospital setting or um, clinic setting in my case. So I work with the pediatric diabetes clinic at Vanderbilt. So I'm going to show you a few things that um, I have helped some of our um, kids be able to cope with different aspects of having diabetes and needing um, injections. So um, I think some of them may be able to apply to this population as well. So No, it's not what, okay, here we go. Um, one of the big things that I talk, and a lot of these tips and tricks are going to be more geared towards um, the younger population, you know, um, preschool age and younger elementary, but it, it can still definitely be relevant to um, older teens and then even adults. Um, and with thing that I'm to allow as much control for um, or uh, allow for as much control and autonomy as possible, um, but also keeping in the boundaries of medical necessity. Um, so, for example, you might say it's time for enzyme therapy. Do you want it in your arm or your leg? You want to be careful to avoid questions such as are you ready for your shot when that's not a choice? So if you've gone through the effort of getting everything prepared, then um, you ask them if they're ready, then they say no, because that's very typical of somebody not wanting to do something. Um, and then you have to force the, the issue. Um, along with that, I also like to encourage our families, um, you know, in our situation, we call it insulin in this um, enzyme therapy or whatever you need to refer to it as, um, just because sometimes, especially for those younger children, it may be confusing um, if you use medicine as the general catch-all term. So like if 
somebody, uh, a child has a cold and you talk about getting medicine, then it may confuse them if um, you're referring to the cherry flavored cough medicine versus uh, what they would need for their injection. So that's just a little side note about that. Um, Another thing that we found often with our kids um, who have anxiety in getting injections is that a lot of times the buildup of the injection or the shot can cause more anxiety than the shot itself. Um, so we um, talk about sometimes using a timer so they can mentally kind of prepare um, there's also like apps on your phone where you can have a picture that shows up after, you know, like you can say in two minutes or in five minutes, um, we're going to go ahead and get your uh, enzyme therapy um, and try to avoid delays if possible. Like obviously some delays are unavoidable, but, you know, if you know that one of their delay tactics is I have to go to the bathroom, then, you know, you might say you have this five minutes that the timer is set that you can go ahead and go to the bathroom. Um, so they kind of know those expectations up front because um, a lot of times kids are going to push the boundaries as much as possible. And that's, that's very normal. Um, another thing is like to have a schedule. So whether you have the six days a week or three days a week or whatever, like letting them know kind of, so that it's not a surprise. Um, maybe they know like, I'm going to get my, injection and then immediately we're going to get to do um, a special show or you know something like that consistency is good and I like to encourage families to not do it whenever they the child is um, extremely tired or hungry or if you're in a rush um, make sure that you have plenty of time so that um, everybody kind of has patience and able to cope as much as possible um, I've got a couple of pictures of comfort holds um, for kids, and these are just examples, but what I like to encourage families is, you know, try some things out, do what feels best for you. I like to encourage people to avoid um, laying on top of your child or doing like the papoose where you wrap them in a sheet, um, just because a lot of times that adds an additional piece of anxiety. So if you're kind of able to put them in a comfort position so that whenever it's all finished, then you can go ahead and do the nice hugs, um, but also with that comfort hold, then you have a little bit more of um, control over, you know, being able to make sure that you don't have flailing arms um, and legs during that. Um, I also like to encourage families to do lots of medical play. Um, you can do different types of medical play um, where with um, insulin or with syringes, you can, with, or with kids who have like a needle phobia, this would be something that you would want to be a part of, um, but using the tools specific for injections. So like having a syringe, um, letting them do that on a cloth doll or a teddy bear or something so that they are able to help the stuffed animal feel better. Um, another thing that you can do with syringes without needles is uh, water play where they can kind of squirt or paint um, just so that it becomes a familiar thing and it um, kind of desensitizes the, the anxiety from that. Um, for the younger kids, um, just a regular play kit that has doctor's tools in it so that they can kind of help with their environment um, and have that freedom to play with the medical um, as much as possible. And even like with the specific to injections, like a real world example is um, my daughter has a very extreme phobia to needles and has had for a long time. And when I started this position, I had brought some things home to kind of look through some stuff and she was able to manipulate the syringe into the fake skin and do some practice things. And now she wants to be a nurse. So, um, you know, being able to kind of move past some of that um, anxiety with just like non-medical invasion type thing. So um, here's a few examples of some of the cartoons that will, um, you can 
click on, you know, your PBS or different things so that you can um, allow them to have those opportunities um, to see shows. Um, and then there are a few different things that we talk to families about for those kids who have a really hard time getting injections. Uh, one thing that we use in our clinic is called Buzzy and it uh, vibrates and you can also put an ice pack on that area. Um, and so, you know, as Karen was talking about kind of rubbing it in um, with Buzzy, it kind of distract the uh, brain from feeling the injection or the medicine as much. Um, and so a lot of our kids, we do that for flu shots, but for kids who are having a really hard time getting started with their injections, then it's an option to be able to purchase that online. Shot blocker is similar to that. Um, it's less expensive. Um, it's just like a more silicone material. Um, I haven't had as good of luck with that, but it is still an option for people who um, need something to kind of help with that. Um, so just to wrap up, we have a few additional tips. Um, one thing is for people who are on social media, you might notice that there's a lot of people who are sharing their stories. Um, but one thing that I have found super encouraging for some of our families is um, to create videos. Now, whether or not you wanna put that out on social media, that's your family's choice, but even just having the kids to be able to create those videos um, for their own self. And a lot of times they really enjoy being the teacher um, and showing off their skills. And so that was kind of a fun way for them to, to have con some control um, and work through that. Um, another thing we like to talk about is to develop a routine. Uh, so maybe it's uh, you make up a chant or a song um, so that there's kind of like something that they can get from this experience to know that they're brave. Um, and then, like as we talked about before, allowing for as much control and participation as possible. So, you know, maybe they're not ready to give their own shots, but they can wipe the skin. Um, or count or you know, do something like that to be able to help with that piece. Um, make sure that you have supplies ready because nothing's worse than getting the kid all ready and psyched up to do it. And then you have to go through each of the steps and then you've lost them and they're ready to go on to the next thing or um, they're, they've had additional time to build up anxiety. So unless they're helping you to get everything prepared, it's um, best for the supplies to be ready. Um, and as Karen was talking about, taking deep breaths uh, is hugely beneficial for not only the child or the person who is anxious, but the parent as well. So making sure that you're um, all in a place of feeling like you've got this and um, it's going to be okay. Um, and then we use distraction a lot for our kiddos who are extremely anxious. Um, so maybe like this is the time that they get to watch their favorite show or they can play a game. Um, you know, there's lots of games where you can do it one handed. So if you have an iPad, then they can facilitate that game or um, looking at bubbles or something like that that kind of helps go along with um, being able to cope with that. Um, just a couple others that I had, um, make sure that you're honest. Try not to say, oh, this is, this is just a shot or this isn't going to hurt because we know that sometimes, you know, if it hits in a certain spot, um, so don't make promises that you can't keep, be honest as much as possible um, and make sure that you let the child know that their medical team is there to help and support. I've had some families who are like, that mean old doctor is making me do this um, and you know, that we just like to make sure that families know um, that we're on your side. We want to make sure that the kids have everything they need to be healthy and safe. And um, I hope that this was able to help some of you. Yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Um, we again, we had like two or three questions that came in um, that I figured I would just ask you quickly. Um, one of them was just about when a child is ready to self inject. Um, are there signs that I, we've seen some children super young who are ready to self inject? 
Um, my son actually started to self-inject and then stopped for a little while and then started again. Uh, do you have any advice about that? Is there a certain age or any kind of signs where you, you can tell a child's truly ready to take on that responsibility? Yeah, I don't know that there's necessarily every, like you said, every child is different. Um, we had a child in the clinic that was four years old and he seemed like he was ready. And we were like, no, we're not ready for you. <laughs> you need to um, be ready for that. And so um, I think that every child is a little bit different. Um, so I, I would say generally our clinic recommends um, that they are in, you know, not necessarily even like an age, but they've kind of had this experience for a long enough period of time. Um, and so every family is going to be different and, you know, being able to don't just say like, oh, my kid's ready. And so they go and do it in the bathroom all by themselves. Like you, it needs to still be like a, a process of making sure that the families are involved to watch and observe and then to be able to be there if there is a step that was missed or, um, you know, double checking the amount of medicine in the syringe is something that also, you know, those little ones, the points, uh, 0.5 to 0.6 may not make a difference in a little one's eyes, but to a parent, you can see that there's a difference or making sure that the bubbles are out and stuff. Yeah, I also think that just letting them getting involved in a piece of the process sometimes is helpful mm -hmm. too, rather than doing the whole thing, you know, maybe just starting by preparing the syringe or preparing mm -hmm. the area and just giving them some, you know, sense of ownership in the process right. is, is probably a, a good transition. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, question that we had, um, you know, uh, there's a, a family said they got off to a rocky start with injections and that trust has been undermined. Do you have any tips to go ahead to build up that trust again. And, you know, if you get to a point where you just really aren't having any success, where should you go for help? So I know like in our clinic setting, we have a um, clinic psychiatrist that families are able to meet with. Um, and so sometimes it's just like having that period of time. Um, so I would say that most likely your uh, clinic or doctors probably has some counselors or somebody that can um, kind of help guide. So, you know, somebody who's more familiar with the medical setting to be able to help guide. Um, but it's okay to, you know, take a step back and, you know, start with some of the things that are more basic, um, you know, like they might have started doing some of the part on their own, but then, you know, if you, like you said, if you needed to take a step back and do like some medical play or do something um, from a, a more beginning standpoint. Um, and I like to make sure that, the kids understand why it is that we do stuff because I think that that kind of helps to um, make it seem like we're not just trying to be mean, um, but as long as making sure that they know this is why we're doing it and this is how it's going to help being able to have those conversations. Yeah, and education. Mm -hmm. And I also, the one of the other parts that really resonated was just the, the videos. Um, we've seen firsthand some of the um, ways that kids love to, to kind of show off their newfound skills or, um, and we have a, a program called Partner and Learn, where if a, if a patient or a parent is having a challenge with a child, we can actually um, pair them up with another child who's the same age mm -hmm. and they can send encouraging videos and showing, hey, I just did my injection, you know, and you, it kind of make it fun mm -hmm. and, and give them kind of a pen, a, you know, a pen pal, but, you know, a, right. a video pen pal just to, to share their experiences and talk about it and, um, you know, let them know that they're not the only ones that are going yeah. through this validating their feelings. So, um, okay, great. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. Um, our final speaker tonight is Sarah Hansen and she's with Alexion. She's a one source case manager. She joined Alexion in 2014 and her territories include Pennsylvania, Washington, DC, Tennessee, Michigan, and Illinois. Prior to coming to Alexion, Sarah worked as an emergency department nurse and a pediatric ICU nurse at hospitals in Connecticut. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. We are looking forward to your presentation. Hi, thank you very much, Deb. I am going to share my screen. 
let me know if you can't see that. So good evening, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Sarah Hansen, and I am a case manager from OneSource. Before I get started, I just wanted to thank Softbones very much for having me here tonight and to all of you for taking time to learn more about the resources that Alexion has available to help support patients and caregivers with injections. And just a few disclaimers on my first slide. This presentation is sponsored by Alexion and any information within the presentation should not be construed as medical advice. And patients and caregivers should always consult their doctor for any questions related to administering Strenzik, including injection technique or side effects. Okay. So also before I begin, I just begin, I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, the Strenzik important safety information, the full prescribing information, including the patient information and instructions for use can be found at strenzik.com. So today I am going to be reviewing the injection starter kit. This kit is mailed to new strenzik patients with a diagnosis of perinatal, infantile, or juvenile onset HPP with the first shipment of strenzik that goes, uh, gets shipped by Panther Specialty Pharmacy. So before I review the kit, I, I thought we would take a quick look at the journey to injection. The journey starts with your physician, your provider submitting a prescription to the specialty pharmacy. Panther will then reach out to the doctor's office to confirm the information on the prescription. And for patients who choose to enroll in OneSource, upon receiving the OneSource enrollment form, your case manager is gonna reach out to you with a welcome call to review the support services that the program offers and start to answer your questions. So then Panther is going to work to verify the funding, your insurance. And for patients who are enrolled in OneSource, the case manager will send a patient starter kit. And we will also work in conjunction with Panther um, to review your funding and any support services. When you receive an approval, Panther is going to reach out to you to arrange for the shipment of the supplies to go over the dosing and to set up that first shipment date. And for patients enrolled in OneSource, uh, the case manager will be reaching out to talk about next steps. And the injection starter kit that I'm about to review, it's going to come with that first shipment from Panther with the medicine and with the supplies. And so if you're enrolled in one source, the case manager will do much like I'm about to do now, go through each of those pieces with you. And, and at that time, you'll have the kit in front of you and be able to you know, hold it in your hand and have an even better understanding of, of the kit. And then from there, Panther and OneSource case managers will continue with outreaches and ongoing support. So this slide shows uh, some of the contents of the injection starter kit. It includes uh, the injection starter kit cases, a Panther, wel Panther welcome letter, an injection IQ brochure, an injection supplies mat, an injection site tracker and calendar, a travel requirement letter, and an injection site reaction brochure. So now we're gonna go through these pieces one by one. The first one is the injection starter kit case. So the pieces of your injection starter kit all come in this case. The smaller case is going to contain the educational materials and the larger case is going to contain the injection supplies. And I think it's really important to note that, that this case provides a, a place to store your HPP educational materials and your supplies, but this is not meant for drug storage or for travel. There is a Panther welcome letter included, and this is going to outline the contents of the injection starter kit and go into a bit of detail. 
But one of the very important things on this letter is the contact information for Panther. And it's important to keep that handy because you might have a question that comes up about Stransic or about your supplies or about shipment. So it's always good to have that number handy. There is an injection IQ brochure. And this is a key instructional guide on how to prepare and administer your strengths. It provides a helpful play by play like quick tips and it includes information on approved injection sites. Guidance on needles and how long strands can be left out of the refrigerator. There is also an injection supplies mat, so this is a laminated mat that also shows the approved injection sites and guidance on needles and has key tips for administration. And this is helpful because it's a nice clean surface that you can lay out your injection supplies and get everything organized before you do your injections. There is an injection site tracker and calendar. And so this is a laminated card, it's double-sided a dry erase board and it comes with a marker and this allows you to track where and when you're doing your injections as you are rotating your sites through the approved injection sites. There is a travel letter. So many patients on Stransic travel and in preparation for air travel, we send this letter to you in the kit. And it is uh, something that you can show to TSA and the airline staff. And it outlines the travel requirements and provides important information on the medication and on the supplies and about storing the medicine and supplies in the cabin during the flight. And there's also a brochure called Managing Your Injection uh, Site Reactions. So the most common side effects of Strenzik are local skin injection site reactions. And uh, if the patient or the patient's loved one has questions or issues related to injections, please follow up with your physician. But this brochure is helpful because it provides information about injection site reactions, um, injection tips, how to talk to your provider about injection site reactions, and also has important safety information. Living with a rare disease can be challenging as a patient, as a caregiver, and many patients and caregivers want to connect with other patients in the HPP community who are navigating a journey that's maybe similar to their own. And so this uh, brochure here provides information on a program sponsored by Alexion and OneSource called the Peer Connect Program. And this is a phone-based program and it matches the patient or the caregiver with a star ambassador who will share their own story. And then if you would like, you can share your story and have the opportunity to ask some questions. And then here um, you can see that we have a card that provides information on the Strunzik Facebook page and on the Strunzik website. So these resources provide additional educational opportunities, as well as more opportunities for, for those community connections. And I think it's always important to, to point out that HPP is rare, but you are not alone. There's, there's a community of HPP patients and caregivers available to provide support, just like being on, on this meeting with soft phones right now. And then finally, the, the last resource that I wanted to mention is an injection courage video. So it's normal, totally normal to feel a little intimidated when you're learning to inject Strenzik. And so this video, it features a star ambassador and his caregiver, and it provides support and encouragement related to injections. And if you haven't seen it already, I, I highly suggest um, watching it. It's a, it's a great resource. And so um, that is the end of my presentation on, um, on the injection starter kit. And um, again, thank you so much for, for having me this evening. And um, please let me know if anybody has any questions.
Thanks, Sarah. Um, we did have a question that came in. Um, if if somebody has been on therapy and uh, maybe some of those resources might be helpful, is there a way they can have you know an element of the kit sent to them? Like somebody was asking about the the injection site tracker. Sure. Um, if if you're already enrolled, please uh, reach out to your your own uh, um, one source case manager. And if you're not enrolled yet and you want to become enrolled, uh, reach out. You can. I don't. I don't know if you want me to. I could give the phone number. Yeah, um, that would be great. 888-765-4700. And that's a number you can call into anytime and they'll always be able to direct you to an HPP case manager uh, who will be able to answer your questions. But if you do have um, your own case manager already assigned to you, feel free to reach out to them. Great. Um, there were a couple other questions that came in that I just would like to um, tee up to the panelists. Um, one was about uh, rotating sites. Uh, a patient shared a story about how after a bad experience with one site, um, her daughter didn't want to inject at any other sites. And now the only place they wanna inject are the arms. So um, Karen or uh, Jenny, I don't know if you have any advice for um, that particular patient about what they can do to try to coerce, um, you know, their, her daughter into trying some of those other sites again. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I'm not sure like what age this child is, but um, one thing that I have done to explain is I use model magic um, or Play-Doh or something um, and show like whenever you inject into like the mono magic versus um, you know, like a tissue or something. And then I lift it up and they can see that the um, insulin was on the table for underneath the, um, the tissue, whereas like it didn't absorb and go beyond the mono magic or the Play-Doh. Um, and so kind of doing a more concrete visualization about like why it's important that we rotate sites um, has helped a few of our kids. Um, we've had some of our nurse practitioners who have encouraged kids to put on um, tattoos, like skin, the tattoos that you can put on and either like put the tattoo on the location that you wanna try and then, you know, go underneath or a different location or um, whatever, location you don't want them to use as we're going to put the tattoo on that arm but you can choose any other site so those are just a couple of tips that we've tried with our our kids great karen did you have anything to add to that no that sounds like a, a great idea i mean uh even you know just trying to encourage the child just every three or four injections to try a new spot would, would be better than always in the arms. So, but no, those are great suggestions, Then Thank you. Great. Another question that we had um, was about the needle length. Um, somebody had an experience where they had a needle that was actually too long. And so uh, I guess the question is just about should we be asking for a particular kind of needle? Should the physician know about the length of the needle? What is your advice about needle size? Karen? Yeah, yes. Uh, we found throughout the study, it's, it's real important to have the two different size needles. The larger one to be sure you can get the drug out better, which would be the 21 gauge. But of course, that's going to be way too big to do into um, the skin. And then we suggest the 30 gauge needle. So um, you probably have to have their physician uh, order these specifically to get those. Um, it, I can send you, you know, what I have written on here as how to maybe get them to uh, order it. It's uh, a slip tip uh, syringe with the needle and the um, precision glide 30 gauge needle. Okay. 
And what about the length of the needle? This particular patient said she that was going too deep, even injecting at the right angle. Is it is a sub Q a particular length of needle or what's your? Um, it's easier if it's the smaller needle, um, but you wouldn't want to in, uh, insert the the whole length of the needle for um, a sub Q injection. So how is there, are they, is that determined by how far you inject it or how long the needle is? Uh, so if you're stuck with just the larger needle, you'd have to be sure that you're going to get a hold of uh, the better amount of, of, of skin in order to inject it. Cause you don't want to do more than what, half inch? No, I wouldn't want to do that. You wouldn't want to go more than a half inch into the skin. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and then I had an, uh, another question, and, and Jenny, this one's probably a good question for you um, about a child who um, tenses up, um, you know, to a point where the needle actually comes out. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she's tried a couple different techniques. Uh, people seem really shocked that, you know, she has this kind of a reaction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she's trying to figure out, you know, what, what's next and, and what is your advice? Yeah. And that's why I would say like practicing those things whenever it's in a more calm environment, like not right before you give the injection, but, um, practicing deep breaths. There's an organization um, that used to be kids kicking cancer. And now they've um, gone beyond just that. Um, so it's Hero Circle. And so they have um, a really great program for all kids to be able to practice breathing. And so some of those exercises that you can do, and so you can nickname, like we're going to do our ninja breath now. Um, so practicing those um, tricks you know, giving them those pieces of control, like what do you want to do whenever you get the injection? Like, do you want to blow bubbles? Um, those kind of things. You know, some people have really positive experiences with um, the mind, like allowing them to kind of relax and doing um, some of that kind of work. Uh, so there's there's a few different things, but yeah, that definitely like trying to explain to kids that if they tense up, then it hurts more, isn't always effective. Sometimes they're able to really understand that piece of it, um, but that is a, a challenge. So I, I would suggest like trying to practice um, as much as possible and kind of coming up with some different tools in your toolbox that will help during those times. Terrific. Karen, Jenny, Sarah, thanks so much for, for spending your, your evening with us tonight and for all of your expertise. And thank you for the questions, um, those who joined us. Those were really good questions. And I think uh, ones that many of us share. So um, we're going to um, conclude the webinar here. For those of you who are joining us for our breakout rooms, uh, stay tuned, look for a, a, a little pop-up on your screen that's going to uh, acknowledge that you want to enter into the breakout room. You do have to click that in order to en enter into the breakout room. So um, thank you so much for a, a great webinar, everybody, and enjoy your evening. Thank, thank you very much. much. Good night, thank everybody. You. Good night. Bye-bye.